the Security Council met on South Sudan this morning. The Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Jean Pierre Lacroix, warned that as the dry season sets in, we face the possibility that the military conflict will escalate, as well as intercommunal fighting. Civilians will suffer the consequences of any escalation of violence, he said, adding that we cannot continue to stand by and watch. Mr. Lacroix therefore urged the Council to remain vigilant and exert more effort to condemn and stop the violence, protect civilians, and urgently facilitate a political settlement of the conflict. Fighting cannot continue in tandem with efforts to craft a durable peace, he said. The two are simply incompatible. The Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, added that while over 2 million people have fled South Sudan as refugees over the past four years, 7 million people inside the country, almost two-thirds of the remaining population, still need humanitarian assistance. One and a quarter million people are in an emergency phase of food insecurity. That's almost twice as many people one step away from famine as the same time last year. In early 2018, half of the population will rely on emergency food aid. Mr. Lowcock called on council members to use their influence to ensure that the parties comply with their obligations under, interna under international humanitarian law to respect and protect civilians, including humanitarian workers, and to ensure that the parties allow and facilitate humanitarian relief operations and people's access to assistance and protection. The victim's rights advocate, Jane Connors, is wrapping up a four-day visit to South Sudan. This morning, she briefed the press in Juba on her role as the UN's first victim's right advocate and on the mission's effort to prevent and respond to sexual exploitation and abuse in close partnership with the UN system in the country. She also strongly reiterated the Secretary General's message of zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse. During her trip, she met with UN representatives and civil society. She also visited the protection of civilian site in Malakal and met with community and traditional leaders, as well as the humanitarian community. This is her second visit to a peacekeeping mission since taking up her assignment in September, after visiting the Central African Republic with the Secretary General in October. Stefan de Mistura, the Special Envoy for Syria, spoke to reporters in Geneva today and confirmed that the Syrian government has informed him that its delegation will return to Geneva on the 10th of December. After that, he said, discussions with the parties will continue with no preconditions until the 15th of December. Based on how this round of talks goes, the special envoy said he will assess whether the parties are negotiating seriously and, and draw conclusions accordingly. And Mr. De Mistura's special advisor, Jan Egeland, also briefed the press on the situation of some 400,000 people trapped in eastern Gauta, adding that for the past six months, we have been tra trying to get acceptance from the Syrian government of a very detailed evacuation plan for what is now 494 people who need to leave Eastern Gata on, on medical grounds. He again pleaded with the for the government to allow those evacuations, including those of children with serious long-term medical conditions. This afternoon, the Deputy Secretary General will depart New York for Paris to co-chair the ministerial meeting of the International Support Group for Lebanon on the 8th of December. On Sunday, the 10th of December, she will proceed to Quito, Ecuador, to ad address the high-level panel of eminent personalities of the South to be held the following day. The Deputy Secretary General will return to New York on Tuesday, the 12th of December. From the, De the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the World Food Program warned today that an acute hunger emergency in the greater Kasai could turn into a long-term disaster. While the agency has been working against the clock to help ever more people, cash is quickly running out. Claude Jibidar, WFP's representative in the DRC, said that a tightly planned surge makes a big difference, but WFP has largely funded this from its own resources. He added that without immediate donor support, many will die, particularly women and children. With 3.2 million people desperately short of food, WFP has stepped in with emergency assistance. A lull in fighting has allowed more staff to be deployed. As a result, the number of people assisted has grown rapidly, from 42,000 in September to 225,000 in November. But donors' reluctance to commit to Kasai is jeopardizing this effort. From Geneva, the humanitarian coordinator in, in Ukraine, Neil Walker, today urged member states to support the 2018 Humanitarian Response Plan, which calls for $187 million to help 2.3 million people in the country's east. As Ukraine enters its fourth year of conflict, many people in conflict areas have exhausted their savings and ability to cope. They're now forced to make impossible choices between food, medicine, shelter, heating, or their children's education. Mr. Walker said that the people of eastern Ukraine continue to pay the highest price for the conflict, adding that while Ukraine may no longer be front-page news, 
millions of men, women, and children urgently require our help. And we've been informed that the World Food Program will stop providing food to conflict-affected people in the East at the end of February 2018. Food insecurity levels have doubled in both government-controlled and non-government-controlled areas with up to 1.2 million people in need of food. Our colleagues at the Food and Agriculture Organization tell us that even though global food production is booming, localized drought, flooding, and conflicts have intensified and perpetuated food insecurity. According to FAO's latest Crop Prospects and Food Situation Report, some 37 countries, 29 of which are in Africa, require external assistance for food. Ongoing conflicts continue to be a key driver of food insecurity, having triggered near famine conditions in northern Nigeria, South Sudan, and Yemen, as well as widespread hunger in Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Syria. And adverse weather conditions are also taking their toll on farm food outputs in some regions, notably due to drought in East Africa and floods in parts of Asia. The full report is available online. The World Health Organization today said that the number of people affected by dementia is set to triple in the next 30 years, going from 50 million people with dementia to 152 million by 2050. According to the agency, the annual global cost of dementia is $818 billion, equivalent to more than 1% of gross, global gross domestic product. By 2030, the cost is expected to have more than doubled to $2 trillion, a cost that could undermine social and economic development and overwhelm health and social services, including long-term care systems. WHO has just launched a Global Dementia Observatory, an online platform to track progress on the provision of services for people with dementia and for those who care for them, both within countries and globally. More information is available online. Ahead of Human Rights Day, which falls on the 10th of December, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was proclaimed by the General Assembly back in 1948, the High Commissioner underscored the need for the values enshrined in this landmark document to be defended. He cautioned that the universality of rights is being contested across much of the world, pointing to what he called mounting cruelties and crimes being perpetrated in conflicts around the world, as well as rising levels of nationalism, racism, xenophobia, and other forms of discrimination. His full message is available online. And today is International Civil Aviation Day. This year's theme is working together to ensure that no country is left behind and highlights the International Civil Aviation Organization's efforts to assist states in implementing standards and recommended practices so they can have access to safe and reliable air transport and can address safety, security, and emissions-related issues. Like I said, we'll have Jimmy McGoldrick uh, talking about Yemen right after. Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Um, eight members of the Security Council have asked for an emergency meeting on Jerusalem, and they have asked for the Secretary General to brief the meeting. Um, the meeting is expected to take place tomorrow morning. Will the Secretary General be briefing? Uh, our expectation, uh, if a meeting is called tomorrow, and I, I believe it's yet to be confirmed, but we anticipate that there will be something tomorrow, and if that's the case, uh, then uh, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Nikolai Mladenov, will brief the council members uh, by video conference. Yes, Ali. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Do you have anything on the clashes? today in the uh, uh, occupied territories between the Israeli forces and the demonstra uh, demonstrators. Uh, this is one. And uh, the second uh, part of my question is about the legality of the uh, of President Trump uh, announcement regarding the move of the uh, embassy to uh, Jerusalem and to recognize Jerusalem as the capital uh, of Israel. Uh, asking about the legality from the UN perspective. Thank you. Uh, well, regarding that, you're aware of the uh, resolutions of the Security Council, and you're aware that the Security Council does intend to hold discussions tomorrow, so we'll be uh, waiting to see what, uh, what they have to say. You've already heard what the Secretary General had to say on the issue. As he made clear, Jerusalem is a final status issue that must be resolved through direct negotiations between the two parties on the basis of the relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, taking into account the legitimate concerns of both the Palestinian and the Israeli sides. Uh, as for your question about uh, 
uh, today's clashes. As, as you know, we've always been concerned about making sure that uh, the status quo in the city of Jerusalem is preserved, and we hope that all, uh, all sides will exercise calm and restraint. Does the, uh, the Secretary General have a say on the legality of the U.S. move, or this is a U.S. sovereign decision? Thank you. Uh, he's, he's made his comment on, uh, on what he believes the situation is and, uh, and uh, what is needed uh, in what he's told you yesterday. And like I said, we will await uh, anything further in uh, discussions as, uh, as the Security Council is scheduled to meet. Yes, please. It's also on Jerusalem. Has the SG spoken to the White House or to any officials from the United States on the issue of Jerusalem? You know, um, Mr. Trump spoke to many world leaders, and I was wondering if the SG was one of them. If not, did like the SG speak to anybody about this um, dangerous move? Thank you. Uh, we've made clear our views, including through various interlocutors, but no, the Secretary General has not spoken uh, by phone with President Trump. Uh, yes, Joe. Yeah. Uh, really a simple question. Uh, has a date yet been set uh, for the Secretary General to have a year-end press conference? What the Secretary General intends is actually to have a press conference for the beginning of the year. So what we're looking forward to is uh, something that will be in the, in the early part of January. Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, it appears that uh, Mr. Faltman has met with uh, Ri Yong Ho, the foreign minister of North Korea. Is there anything at all you can say about that meeting or about the progress of his trip? Not, not really at this stage. Uh, we're, we're aware of the discussions he's been having. Uh, uh, we, we believe uh, uh, that uh, the process so far has been uh, constructive, but we won't have any particular details to share until a little bit later once he's completed his trip. Yes, Nisar. Do, do you have any updates about the uh, relief to Yemen? Are there uh, any ships coming to Yemen? You're in luck. The, the, the guest of the briefing uh, who is going to speak... Uh, you can't see him. Uh, we only have a, a UN seal up, but uh, uh, Jamie McGoldrick, the humanitarian coordinator, will talk right after we're done. Uh, yes, uh, him first. Yes, yes, you and then. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to. I mean, I, I guess you won't read out the, the 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 meetings that Mr. Feldman's had in North Korea, but the the Swedish ambassador today in front of the State House, in front of the Security Council, said that you know he has a report from Sweden's uh, embassy there. So, can you say whether? Has Feltman met with any of the, uh, the remaining diplomatic corps in Pyongyang? And also, in terms of forgetting readouts, can you say wh what the composition of his team is? Is Katrin Hatt on it? And if so, is she back with DPA? And who else is with him? Usually people do read out who went to a place. Uh, no, we're, we're not doing that at this stage. Uh, like I said, we're waiting until he's completed his visit to, to be able to provide some details. And he does intend... Uh, to uh, brief both the Security Council and the press corps once he's back. And on Jerusalem, I wanted to ask you, the decision, because a number of the ambassadors were saying that they were hoping that the Secretary General would be the briefer. Is there some reason that it's Mr. Mladenov and not, and not Antonio Guterres? We, we feel it's best uh, at this particular point uh, in time for Mr. Mladenov as the lead expert on the ground to provide the details. Yes, Evelyn. Uh, sure. Uh, Press the button and all. Terribly sorry. Thank you, Farhad. Um, Jan Eglund, uh, at his briefing today, talked about um, Syria, the Damascus government, not giving the right licenses to get humanitarian aid into many areas. Is anyone here picking that up and complaining or what? Uh, yes, we've been complaining uh, at, uh, at various levels, but, uh, but uh, I also mentioned at the start of this briefing uh, his concerns, uh, particularly about the situation in eastern Gauta, and, uh, and we're trying to do what we can to make sure that various uh, of these areas that have been uh, essentially under siege for, for a long period of time are opened up. Yes. Yeah, and you, you mentioned in South Sudan that there are two million fled South Sudan, you mean they are refugees? The two million are refugees? Yes. And then you have, can you tell us like how many millions are IDPs as well? And then if you have a break, uh, 
uh, how many, like, where are they, the two millions? I know it's mainly in Uganda, but can you tell us, like, where are they went? Yeah, the, the, the basic numbers are that there's two million who have fled the country as refugees, uh, basically to uh, neighboring countries in, in the Central African region. There's seven million people in need in the country, uh, many of them uh, displaced people. And as you know, uh, there have been uh, uh, well over 100,000 uh, in, uh, in uh, the various UN camps uh, and protection of civilian sites in the country. And uh, one and a quarter million people are in an emergency phase of food insecurity. Yes, Luke. Yeah, shifting gears, <clears throat> I'm sure you and the SG have seen uh, that a prominent American magazine has named these uh, women silence breakers as the person of the year for uh, exposing uh, a really horrible workplace culture and abuses of power by men. I'm curious, does the SG believe that the mechanisms that the UN currently has, particularly here in the Secretariat, putting aside maybe peacekeeping in far off places, are sufficient uh, to address this behavior? It's, it's always hard to say whether something is sufficient. I mean, we are trying to improve the mechanisms. As you know, the Secretary General has put in place new uh, procedures to try to do what we can to improve uh, how uh, any of these allegations can be reported and responded to. At the same time, part of what's needed is a change of culture. Uh, what you've seen with the silence breakers is the idea of changing uh, the idea that certain types of behavior are normal or acceptable. And that requires a change in culture, and that needs to happen here as elsewhere. By the way, one of the things I wanted to point out in terms of the silence breakers that were recognized uh, by Time magazine, one of them is, of course, uh, UNFPA uh, Goodwill Ambassador Ashley J Judd, and we're, and we're uh, proud to see that uh, her work has been recognized. I just follow up. I mean, I, I understand I've seen the quarterly update with the, the roadmap for, for some reform here in the UN. But uh, at least looking in Washington, there is an effort perhaps to go back and look at claims that may have been settled in the past under a different system and uh, maybe open them up again to see if they deserve to be reheard under a new system. Is there any push by the SG to look at sexual claims within this institution in the past and give them the light of day again? Or is, is the past just going to be the past? Well, certainly if, if people have stories like this, you know, outrages uh, that have been committed upon them. They, they need to feel that uh, it's always appropriate and always acceptable for them to speak out and, and they will be listened to. And we do have systems in place, including the work of the ethics office, the ombudsman, the Office of Internal Oversight Services and, and, and various other mechanisms uh, to, to make sure that they're listened to. Yes, in the back. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yesterday, uh, the Secretary General of the State on Jerusalem mentioned about Jerusalem being the capital of both countries, uh, which is echoing what uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon said. Um, is the sec Secretary uh, abandoning or have any ideas of resurrecting the idea to internationalize the, the Jerusalem, place it under a special international regime, as was the original idea uh, back in the late 1940s? I, I, I think uh, what he said yesterday is, is where we stand and uh, how that, that vision, uh, including the vision of a two-state solution is to be achieved, is really a question for the parties and for all of those who are trying to support the peace process. Yes. Sure. I wanted to ask you on, on Burundi. There, there have been the, the most recent round of talks in Arusha has ended without any outcome document and uh, mediator Mkapa is basically blaming the participants and for not moving at all and most of the opposition didn't even attend. Does the UN have, have any comment on what people are saying is kind of a failure of the process and was Mich Michel Cafando there in Arusha or not and if not, where is he? I believe he has been involved in the process. Uh, we'll see whether there's anything he has to say by way of an evaluation, but uh, certainly he is continuing to deal with the various parties and try to, to get the process uh, uh, going again. And on the ramifications for of the, the this uh, indictment of the China Energy Fund Committee and, and what it says in it by name about uh, Sam Kutesa and the, a bribe being directed to the president of, of Uganda, Museveni, and both of the, their role in this process. Has the UN had any reflection on, on, on what this means for the process? Uh, nothing beyond what we've said before. We obviously want the officials who serve as the President of the General Assembly uh, to uphold the highest standards, but 
this as an issue is really an issue that uh, that the government of Uganda needs to respond to, and, and I'll leave uh, the, res the response in their hands. And can I ask you also on Cameroon? I wanted to add, uh, Stefan had said he was, you know, the UN was trying to figure out what President Paul B has said. Since since that time, there there are said to be you know, many people have left the region where they were told that they'll be viewed as collaborators. They don't leave, and now a writer, Patrice uh, Patrice Gananga has uh, been disappeared from the Douala airport. It's a, he's a professor here at Stony Brook, and he went and reported on the Anglophone region and was taken off a flight, and uh, it's uh, whatever. It seems to be a pretty... Many people are saying that somebody needs to get involved. I'm wondering if Mr. Fall is aware of it, if anyone in the UN system has taken note of the disappearance of this journalist. Obviously, everyone who is in Cameroon or traveling through Cameroon, uh, if there's any problems that occur... Uh, during their travels, uh, that needs to be investigated thoroughly by the local authorities. We certainly hope uh, and expect that uh, that uh, this particular person will be found, and we're hopeful that that uh, that nothing untoward has happened. What if the authorities but, are involved? Uh, we'll we'll have to see what happens. But f first and foremost, they need to investigate what's happened.